farming on the Isle of Man has always been an integral part of the Manx community, and the introduction of the tractor in the 1930s revolutionised the industry. Many of us who have been associated with the land all our lives have a strong affiliation with the tools of our industry, and there's nothing more nostalgic than a vintage tractor. Oh, the very smell of that paraffin engine as it just rocks to a stop after a hard day's work is nostalgia at its purest. If you've been to either of the agricultural shows over the past few years, you'll have seen a magnificent display of engines and farming machinery from the first half of the 20th century. And the people who put on these displays and demonstrations are the members of the Southern Vintage Engine and Tractor Club. Ori Mitchell is the current chairman. Well, it was formed by various existing members. I think there's four or five existing members who formed it um, 21, 22 years ago. Um, again, the modern phrase is like-minded people interested in farm machinery, tractors, stationary engines, um, and just came together wanting to do something. Uh, restore them, show them, and the, yes, the club has gone from strength to strength. Um, I think it's something that gets into your blood, or, you, or we're reliving our childhood again. And especially myself, I always remember the sound of the field marshals towing the thrash and tackle along the roads. And in those days, there was no other cars or vehicles on the road, and so the sound of the single-cylinder field marshal just echoed, and you could hear it moving from farm to farm in darkness. They tried to finish either before darkness fell or even finishing with a hurricane lamp. And then the two men with the crew um, would move a thrash and tackle from one farm to another, ready to start the next morning. Um, and it was the aid basically of a hurricane lamp. Uh, trying to get into farmyards, get it all lined up. They had it off to an art. It's also part of our heritage as well, sort of thing. Um, but basically, yeah, most of us nostalgic. Um, it's like the gentleman who's got his small tractor belted to my uh, baler there. John remembers the first time he went baling, the, the same sort of setup. So he just recreated the same setup sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's the nostalgia. But also, I think it's part of the, the heritage, and again, not just the British heritage, but Manx heritage as well, that um, a lot of things changed in our generation. The Grey Fergies changed the style of farming after the war. Everyone was so used to horses. The Grey Fergies took over um, and just changed the face of farming. And most of us remember that era. Um, one or two of our members, they'll clout me, but they remember even a bit further back. But um, no, I think most of us remember the Grey Fergie taking over and changing the face of farming. And things have changed. Every, even tractors now are computerized. Um, so, yeah, nostalgia and reliving our childhood. Ori Mitchell. The club was established many moons ago and one of the founding members was John Corkish, who, even though he's in his 80th year, is still as busy as ever. I've been associated with tractors and farming all my life. And as regards this binder, I salvaged this this year from Mr. Hampton Crea. It has been in a shed, and that big storm in January, the roof went off the shed. So I got informed it was there, and if I didn't, if somebody didn't take it and salvage it, it was going to the scrapyard. And in my opinion, it's such a shame to let things of the sort go to the scrapyard because there's so many said to me today, "What is it? I have no idea what it was." And uh, so it's nice to be able to tell some of the younger generation exactly what it done. Unfortunately, we can't give a work and demonstration of it, but it's as much as we can do to have it running. And uh, so it's, to my knowledge, it hasn't actually been used in anger since 1954, because uh, Hampton's father bought it in 1954, second hand at a farm sale in Kirk Michael and they never used it after they got it. So I assume it was used harvest 1950, 54, but certainly hasn't been used since. Well, it's a binder. It's what, it's what we cut the corn with prior to combine harvesters. 
and of course it was very labour intensive because you would, on a good day, you would cut a field of this size, there's 13 acres in this field and you could quite comfortably, all everything going well, you would cut it. But that was the easy part, the cutting of it. It all had to be stooped after that, then it had to stand in the stook, the sheaves had to stand in the stook and the church bells ring over it three times. Believe it or not, it had it had to have three three Sundays in the field, and then it was seasoned enough then to stack it and store it, and it would be stored and thrashed later on, because there wasn't there wasn't the grain towers and things about at that time. So it was each farm, the thrashing machine travelled around from farm to farm, and you'd done a bit of thrashing, the days thrashing this place, and you'd done the days next, well, and it was taking a crew of somewhere in the regions of 14 or 15 men to, to keep a thrashing machine going ding dong like and because the grain hold had to be taken away after it was uh, thrashed and the straw had to be packed away and, but that's what I say it used to take on an average about 14 men well I'll be quite honest the horses were going out when I left school I've I done a little bit for the horses but very very little and of course, uh, like every kid, even young fellas today, you can't get on the tractor quick enough. Well, I was the same way. I've been driving tractors since I was, well, 10, 11 year old. Old Fords in the, uh, I was driving one of them, harrowing them one thing or another, but certainly when I was 12 year old, and I started off at harvest time, we used to have to move up from stook to stook, like there'd be one man building the load and one Put, pitching the sheaves up to them and uh, there's only one pedal on those your clutch and brake is all in the one and it's that heavy I used to have to stand on it with both feet and let my whole body up when I was <laughs> and for the time they'd get the ten sheaves up your legs would be aching just ready to take the weight off for a split second while you moved along to the neck but it was it was all good fun when we were kids and, but, and I think that's uh, you know it's it's born in India and that's always totally. I've got a grandson now that he's more interested. He's interested enough in the tractors, but I don't think he ever will be to the stage that I've been all my life. He's uh, more railways and buses is his hobby. But uh, I hope that I live long enough to get him on the tractor plowing or plowing match just the same like. So keep my fingers crossed and touch a bit of wood. <laughs> hope for the best. Of course, every tractor has its own story, as Mickey Rubens explains. You go scratching it in the briars and you have a look at it, then you find the owner, see is he prepared to, to sell it, or hopefully give it to you, because they're worth bugger all in that state, but they're usually wanting something for them, and I always like to give something, even if it's only a pound, because then I don't owe him a favour. He's been paid and that's the end of it. You know, he can't come back and want 40 hours work doing on his house. Uh, something like that, I won't be caught out like that. I like to buy it and then I know it's mine. I actually bought an old petrol paraffin Fords and Major off the same farm, off Tom Can Raid, and I gave him the 40 pounds and he thought it was crackers. And a week later, I got Qualtrus Timber Yard in Castletown. They went out with the wagon high up and lifted it out and onto the wagon and brought it home. And it sat on the patio at the back of the house in Colby. And I was busy tinkering with it, knocking rust off it. And I decided to fill the gearbox and engine up with, with red diesel to try and loosen everything up. Well, the diesel was seeping out of all the oil seals onto the ground. and. The wife was, got very annoyed with this because it was getting on her shoes and the smell of diesel in the house and she was struggling past it with the washing basket and uh, she got a bit violent about it and threatened to smash the damn thing up with a sledgehammer if I didn't get it shifted. So I had to get Qualtrus Timber Yard back and they put it back on the wagon and backed further up the railway track where I live and they swung it in over the hedge and I plunked it at the top of the garden and that's where it stayed and I built a shed round it and rebuilt the tractor and I showed it for about, about eight to ten years sorry I sold it, it's out at Baldrine probably never get it back 
It's been in three World Tractor magazines. That tractor it was a very early 1945 model. And uh, I had a lot of fun, but I sold it on, got bored with it. And as you do, you move on and buy another tractor. But at least I saved it. It would have been in the scrapyard. But I, I saved it. And, uh, and actually, that's a lot of why I buy these things. Because I think, well, next step is the scrapyard, and then it's gone. So you get it as cheap as you can. Do it up as cheap as you can. Because you feel it's all dead money, it's all dead. But, but once it's finished, it comes to life. It's not dead money. People will pay you. They will pay you. Um, I, I just recently had a chap offer me a lot of money for the Nuffield, um, which I never thought I'd get here. But seeing in Manx, I won't sell them to the mainland. We've lost a lot of tractors over the past three years. A lot of tractors with a lot of Manx history been here from you and they've gone on low loaders and sold to the British market. What can you do? Because they can distract us here that they would only get £2,000 for where they can get £5,000 in England for and, and that's where they've been going. But it swings and roundabouts. Tractors are starting to come back into this country because there's chaps buying them on the mainland and bringing them back here but they don't have any Manx history, unfortunately. But, you know, it, it's a shame. Like, I've seen chaps, they've come along, they've got interested in vintage tractors. They've run round, scurried round, found a couple of nice tractors. Manx history, been here working on farms, various farms, for 40, 50 years, these tractors. And next thing, these people get fed up, get bored, lose interest get in touch with a dealer on the mainland and put on a low loader and shipped off. Well, this tractor's called a Ferguson 35. It come out before the red and grey one. It's opposite. It's a 1956 model and we believe the first owner was Eddie Qualtrow, Crankmoor Farm. At uh, Gansey, called Shaw Road. Eddie Qualtrow, Cronkmoor, and um, like I say, it's a 1956 tractor, and the trailer belonged to Russian Abbey Gardens, it's original Ferguson trailer, it's the only one on the island, they're very, very scarce, the scarcest hen's teeth actually, um, you'll have a job to find another, because they all rotted away, but that one has been saved and restored, I've had to put a new body on it. This tractor I've rebuilt over the past 12 months. It'll be the last one for a while because it's rather expensive and very time consuming, do, consuming doing them up. I have another two tractors, but I haven't bothered to bring them here today. A Super Dexter, Ford's and Super Dexter, and a Nuffield. The Nuffield is a lot of Manx history. That come from St. Mark's. A fella called Bobby Kelly from Ballet. <laughs> Balakrink, I think. I think it's Balakrink. And that one's at home. Well, I've had to rebuild the whole engine because it was badly worn and wouldn't run properly. I've had to rebuild it, new big ends, shells put in it, new uh, piston rings, new timing chain in the front of it, a new toolbox because that had rotted away, tyres, all these injector pipes have had to be replaced because it was in a very rough state. It was left in the corner of a farm, small holding, with a canvas sheet through over it, and the water was getting through the canvas sheet and holding the damp into it. It would have been better just left out in the open. So it's took a fair bit of time and money, this. So I'm not gonna bother doing any more for a while. I've, I've restored a lot of tractors in the past 25 years. Um, They've all still on the island, I keep moving them on and somebody offers me a bit of profit in it and I let it go and then I always regret that I've sold it because you can never get them back. Once it's gone you can never get it back. Either the chap just doesn't want to sell it back. So um, you got to really think hard before you let it go because you know it's, it just doesn't come back. Over the years, 
the health and safety regulations in the British Isles have changed so much that some of the older machinery just wouldn't be allowed to take to the field. Here's Ori Mitchell again. A machine like this would never be allowed to come out of the factory. Um, there were accidents on farms, but there were the basic health and safety. Quite a few of these ended up with guards around the, the flywheels, but unfortunately you can't really put a guard around the, the endless belt driven from whatever is a tractor or a stationary engine. This day and age, to try and make it safe, there's only three of us go in there to work it, and three of us are competent um, at our jobs of doing what we're doing. And again, we've changed the aspect of the public, but it doesn't stop them from seeing what's going on. We've now got this orange fencing round to keep pub the public away, because none of us want to see an accident on here. Um, but again, as I say, this machine would never come out of the factory as it is because it's just total disregard, well not disregards the health and safety, but in those days the operators were aware of, the, uh, of any accidents, but everyone was made aware of what was happening. They knew they were working with a machine that could be dangerous. Any machine, even with all the guards on, can still be dangerous if you misuse it. Uh, but it's thanks to the likes of John Crane, who's on the field here today, and others away that I've worked with, that they've made me aware of the dangers of these machines, and you learn to respect them. And the one sound that will bring back a lot of memories for many, many people in the Isle of Man is the field marshal. Right, it's a bit complicated, well not complicated to start it, but it's a, bit, a little bit time consuming. It's not just a case of turning a key. This tractor is a single cylinder, two stroke diesel engine and it started with rather a large starting handle in the flywheel on the side there but prior to that we have to set it up ready for starting and part of that process is to put an ignition paper in this holder on the cylinder head so I've just got to get a paper prepared for that and set the tractor up for starting. This ignition paper is basically a, a piece of blotting paper which is soaked in a couple of chemicals, one of which is saltpeter um, and it produces a glow, it doesn't actually burn as such with a flame, the paper just glows and it just gives sufficient heat to vaporise the fuel oil when it first goes into the cylinder. The flywheel, there are marks to set up there to get the piston in the correct position for starting. Set the decompression wheel. The ignition paper has been lit, glowing red, put back into the cylinder head. And now it's just a case of swinging it over briskly and hopefully it'll start. It was made by Marshalls of Gainsborough in Lincoln and Marshalls made steam engines to start with and they developed this Marshall, the field Marshall tractor for agricultural work. They also made other Marshall products as well, Marshall road rollers for example. But this tractor is a bit unique in that it was developed as a diesel engine tractor when other manufacturers were progressing with petrol and paraffin. So it was an early diesel tractor. This particular one is um, 58 years old. Uh, it's in original condition. It's uh, a contractor's model, which means that it was used in, to be used in conjunction with a threshing mill. Um, basically, it has some extras such as a lighting set on it. It has one headlight, a couple of side lights and a rear light, so it could be used on the road at night. And it has a winch on the back of it, which was used to assist the mill getting in and out of the, the hackett on the farmyard. 
basically these two tractors, these two field marshals are sort of in original condition, so they just need sort of looking after on a, on a day to day basis, just general maintenance really like you'd do with any engine. They are restored, some people restore them from just absolute heaps of rust. Uh, there's a cost element to it and also a time factor, you know, but if you've got the money and the time, anything's possible. All of the parts for this tractor are still available today. You know. um, there's a company in Lincoln called Crawford's who were the agents for Marshalls when these were made. Crawford's are still going strong today and they can obtain just about any part for it still, you know, say, sort of 60 years hence. So I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. You can't say that about many modern tractors when companies are buying each other out so often. Um, the parts are made from the original drawings. Uh, Crawford's have a wealth of knowledge about the tractor because they've been brought up with it as well. Sad to say that the Gainsborough factory of Marshalls was pulled down last year, uh, but the main gates have been kept. Probably a lot of the tractors here have a lot more value in sentimental terms than they do in actual financial terms. Uh, there's a lot of love, sweat gone into restoring them. Um, yes, parts aren't cheap either. Um, a lot of the parts for the vintage tractors are, are made by specialist companies, but some of the, the more common tractors, there is a bigger market out there for the spare parts, so there is a bit of competition in the spare parts market. Uh, the likes of the Marshall tractor here, there is only really the one supplier of, of the spare parts, so they tend to be a bit pricey. Um, yeah, it, it's not... Um, a hobby which is out of reach of most people you know most of the lads here today are just ordinary sort of uh, ordinary lads you know family men um, but they tinker away in their sheds or garages and uh, restore these tractors you know with basic sort of hand tools and small equipment the southern vintage engine and tractor club have monthly meetings and part of the excitement and fun of the club meeting is reminiscing uh, lots of the guys talk about how it used to be when they were using these for real on the farm and, and even before this with, with horses of course and some of the tales that come out are entertaining and well they're stories that can't be repeated as generations pass by you know it's, it's good to have that, that knowledge and their experience passed on. Keith Watterson. The process of restoring a tractor to its former glory can take months even years to complete especially after years of neglect. And it's not only hard work, it takes a lot of love and care as well. So what motivates people to spend hours, days, weeks and months lovingly restoring these engines? Well, I got bored with going fishing. And I suppose I was looking for a bit of a hobby and one day I went to the Southern Agricultural Show and there was these chaps with old stationary engines. And I says, oh I've got one of the, an engine like that at home. I said, it come out of our cement mixer. And this chap says, well why don't you paint it up and bring it along and join the club? So I did. I got the engine running again, all painted up as petrol paraffin engine with a magneto on it for sparks made a little trolley for it and brought it along. Then I found a bigger trolley out of a three-wheeler car chassis, so I had an old turnip cutter sat on the lower part with a belt and this engine driving the turnip cutter through a belt. And then it progressed to more engines. And then I got fed up with them and I sold a lot for 800 quid and went to Turkey for a fortnight on the proceeds. Blocked the money in a post office account so I wouldn't spend it and went off to Turkey. And then I started to get involved with tractors because I was brought up on a farm. My father was a farm labourer all his life. Keep me occupied, keep me out of mischief. <laughs> this, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just one of them things. You, you've either got the notion to do it or you haven't got the notion to do it. But it can be damned expensive, like, when you start buying parts. But that I didn't... The, if I had to buy, bought new canvases for that, I made, I repaired two of them and I actually made one out of a sheet of canvas because I was fortunate enough to have the, the rivets and I got a joiner to cut the wood, the wooden lats and I made that canvas. 
but they tell me they're about £150 a piece to buy them. So, and there's three on there, so it's... Uh, and I'm only a pensioner. I've been a farm worker more or less all my life, so I haven't got a big lot of money behind me to go to spend on the likes of that. So you are improvise, and uh, it's... It's work, it's work, and I don't see any reason why it won't work in anger as well as running here with doing nothing. Some of them come readily available. Someone will say, oh, I've got a tractor in the backyard. Does anyone, do you know anyone who wants it? Or either you see it for sale or word of mouth. Um, there are others still around. But uh, no, uh, when it comes to restoring them, um, again, it's become big business because there's a lot of manufacturers or dealers out there, not on the island but off island, who will supply materials or parts. And again, some of the small parts for the field marshal, I can fax to a dealer in Lincolnshire today and small parts I'll have in the post the next more, next dinner time they'll, they'll turn up. So, um, the, and again, most parts can be got now because there's other people fabricating, not the genuine parts, but they are fabricating replacement parts. Depends on the condition when you buy it. Um, some you can end up spending, oh, two thousand pound, and others you may get away with five hundred quid. You may just want a set of tyres and a little bit of tinkering. You don't value your time, um, but it can be very expensive. Lots of these machines are done up over a period of about three or four years to spread the cost. The beauty about tractors, they don't rust. Like I've, I had a lovely Volvo sports car, but I was always spending money on it. Every year, all the time, it was going rusty and you're buying panels or having to repaint it up. And car parts, and cars in general, you spend an awful lot of money. I'd never ever have another classic car. But a tractor will stand up to the weather. There's better metal, obviously, in them. And once you've done them up, usually that's it. It doesn't need anything more doing to it, other than maybe in five years' time give it another coat of paint, which you're not too fussy with a tractor, are you? You know, you, most of them, of course, they paint their own, and they look great, good enough, you know. Well, technology in the farming industry has come on leaps and bounds over the course of the last century. But although we're grateful for the latest modern technology, and indeed at times it seems we couldn't live without it, sometimes it's nice to look back fondly 